decided to go back into battle with Brad. I think round eight, 2019 was the last time you coached against each other. Uh, not really. Um, excited about the game. Um, you know, they're, they've clearly improved and um, you know, the big occasion, and I think it will be a big occasion, one o'clock on a Sunday country game at the MCG is good for regional people, easier to get to the, to the MCG, expecting a big crowd, but um, I'm assuming that the main reason there'll be a good crowd there is that um, there are two pretty good teams in form that'll put on a good show. So I'm looking forward to that part of it, um, the other part. Not so much, but you know that. You still have to ask, don't you? What, what have you made of the, the improvements that Essendon have made over the first you know, six or eight weeks of the season? I think, I mean, my take on them is they've been a team uh, that uh, have some promising young talent, um, and, and it can take time for young talent to come through, and they seem to be maximising that uh, at the moment. The, the game style looks really solid. We've looked at them pretty closely over a period of, of weeks. Um, and unfortunately, we're not seeing sort of glaring holes in anything they're doing. But that's a, that's a trend across the competition. You know, over the last four or five years, I think it's rare that you actually look at a team and you see really big holes that you can exploit. So once you come to that realisation, then you go back to, OK, well, it's going to be a challenge and we're going to have to play our best and get the fundamentals right. Um, but, but again, if you go back to where they are. I think their good players uh, are playing well. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I'm, I don't say this is a negative at all, but again, I sort of, you can see the talent, but, but um, you know, they are still a young team and um, I would assume that they will keep improving. Is there, I mean, sense of relief is probably not the right word, but is there more just yeah, I mean, how do you feel now compared to, I mean, tip at three, I mean, you guys were calm and, you know, looking at the long term and everything, but now that you've sort of right the ship on a wins and losses thing almost, is there, is there a different feel when you're walking the joint a little bit or...? Not for me. I just feel the same. Um, in, in a way, I wish I felt better going into round one this year, but I felt the same as I did before round one the year before. Uh, and I think it's because I just fully expect that they're going to be ups and downs throughout the season. So the real challenge when you understand that's the way the competition is geared. It, it is, the competition's a handicap, so you don't expect it to get easier year on year. You expect it to get harder. Um, so the challenge becomes making sure that you don't get too ahead of yourself when things are going well and you don't lose your bundle when um, you have the inevitable blips. Ours just happened to come in a bit of a rush at the start of the year. So uh, I think we've been able to achieve that balance relatively well, but um, we've just got to go again. I'm not, not expecting that oh, now we've won a few that the rest of the season will be smooth sailing. There'll still be ups and downs from here. John, I know Segler is back in this week potentially with um, you know, the Drake and Phillips are sort of a, the best duo of the comp that we've all worked for the last week. So how do you mount that challenge with hopefully Segler back? Yeah, it's always uh, an area of our game that we talk about a lot and I think that's a good thing because it suggests that we've got various options. Uh, and the opposition always played a big part in, in our thinking. So, you know, the two genuine ruckmen present a challenge, but, you know, we've, we've got some um, challenges for the opposition as well with a little bit of a different look. But Segler, um, you know, being available, I think, helps. Um, we've just got to work through that a little bit. It's a, still pretty early in our prep, so we've got some unanswered questions that we'll likely work through in the next 48 hours, but it's, it's good to have John available, that's for sure. In terms of um, uh, what you saw from um, Sam in the rough, um, is that sort of does that open things up for you? And, and obviously, it's another option there, or are you sort of came to maybe you know he's a break glass and gets for moves and time. Well, it, I mean, it would be a, it's a proactive move. Uh, I, I've, I've got to say, I, I quite like the idea, and Radigalia playing back um, has made that more of a live option than maybe it has been in the past, but. I'm optimistic that Taconin can become one of the premier key backs in the competition. He, he might be creeping up on that status already. So that always presents a challenge when you're taking a player away from uh, his preferred position. But again, it's sort of nice to have options. And um, even with, with Stanley out injured, it, it's nice to know that you know, we're not absolutely stuck because you know, it's a challenge for every team in the competition with their list management strategy. How many Ruckman do you take on? And, if you have a couple of Ruckman at least who are flexible, that uh, tends to be an advantage.
Hassan has played a bit in the ruck in previous season. Was there a temptation to play him in the ruck instead of Sam last weekend? Yeah, temptation, something that was spoken about. But I think if you compare those two players uh, in isolation, we, you know, more than before the uh, 22 season, we had high hopes for De Koning but couldn't have forecast that he'd play as well as he did as a key back. And on reflection, one of the things that we think helped was the stability that he had in that position. And so we're really seeing Radigalia as a new key back. Uh, and so Sam's probably better equipped to go up in the ruck and then slot back into that position um, because he's played you know, a full year of footy more than Sab in that position. So. Uh, I think it's reasonable to say that while that's an option for us with Radigalia, we'd be much more comfortable trying to stabilise his spot. In terms, of, in terms of that sort of back six, back seven, uh, Jed Hughes is, available. is he available this week? Obviously, he's close to clearing concussion protocols, or what's his um, sort of role look like this weekend? Yeah, that's, my expectation is that he'll be available. Um, I'm not. Given we've still got until Sunday before we play, I haven't had that final tick off yet, and I suspect that. Um, won't come until at least we train today, but it was all tracking well, so we expect him to be available. And it's, as we said, um, consistently over the first month or so, and it's not just us, you look across the competition, if you lose a lot of players in one particular part of the ground, it can be hard to cover. So if he's available, that'll help. Just on Jeremy Cameron's last three weeks, he's kicked 16 goals, and we know how good he is, but how much he contributes, not just kicking goals, but in, in all phases. Is he, do you reckon he could keep 100? Plus, if you just, like purely said, goes focus on you kicking goals and bring out the numbers, do you think he's capable of doing that? Yeah, I wouldn't put anything past him. I think that if I could kind of not directly answer the question, um, I, I think the more relevant question that, that, that I'm asking myself and our coaching group talk about is um, what that would do to our team performance. And, and I think one of the reasons, and there are several, but one of the main reasons that you don't see key forwards kicking 100 goals now is that teams have come to the conclusion that if you are reliant on one player and that goes wrong, you'll get beaten. Um, and again, there are other reasons. The defence is better. Um, you know, like I grew up supporting Hawthorne, believe it or not, and Jason Dunstall was my favourite player. Um, but, and, and so no one likes him more than I do, but he wouldn't kick 100 today. The, the opposition just wouldn't let you do it. Um, so could Jeremy do it? I'm sure he could, but, but I think our team would be poorer for it. That's a fascinating. Um, I mean, it's obviously He'll argue obvious. against that, and it will cost me for the, you know, every time I see him for the rest of my life. <laughs> but I, I should have used Tony Lockett. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a fascinating discussion point, though, isn't it? I mean, you, you kick 100 and... and I mean, yeah, it's, it's just the, the sign of the bottom footy. Um, in terms of, um, if I could just shift elsewhere, I mean, Tazzy's obviously uh, looking like it's going to get the green light, hopefully, this weekend. From a footy industry perspective, is there enough talent in the country to sustain a 19 team? Clearly. It's just a matter of how you distribute that talent, and there are too many players on lists as there is. So if... if there was one extra team but fewer players on every list, then you don't need to find any players. You've, you've got more than enough already. Um, but that's a decision that um, you know, the AFL and the PA um, need to make. But if, it is, if the question is confined to, is there enough talent to sustain one more team easily? Uh, starting the season zero three, yeah. winning left, I know it's not all about wins and losses, but will you have to get down and do some coaching and, and try and tweak a few little things to sort of make things right or was it just purely role execution? Oh no, we're, we're always we're always tweaking things. It was it, it would be if if I've if I've suggested that um, we were okay after the first three rounds and it'll just write itself. Um, you know, if if we just keep rolling out, um, then oh, I misspoke. We, we we did need to change some things and we needed to execute better. But we also didn't need to reinvent the things that we knew would work in time. Um, and some of them were based on personnel coming back. So that tends to be the art of coaching. You've got to work out what needs to change and where do we need to intervene now? Um, and, and what could we make worse if we try to change everything? And that, I mean, that's happened in all my time in footy. You look around the competition and 
I think one of the big mistakes you can make as a, as a coaching group is work on something really hard through the pre-season, have it not work in the first two rounds and then turn it on its head. You, you never get back to um, the point um, just by virtue of you know, not having available training time. So you, you're better off saying, no, no, we're going to persist with these things. But the tweaks at the margin are really important. And you know, if, you, if you looked at one particular part of our game that's been good the last couple of weeks, it was poor in the first three rounds, it was, it was around the ball. And um, so was it because Dangerfield's played a little bit better or was it because collectively we got our method right? It's, it's actually, even after the fact, hard to um, you know, completely work that out. But yeah, we, 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 we have been working hard on our game and we think we've made some changes that have improved it. In terms of the, um, the Tassie comments, uh, in, in the past and in previous seasons, expansion clubs have typically struggled in the first couple of seasons out of the gate. Do you see that as a foregone conclusion that these new clubs are going to potentially struggle in the first two or three seasons as they build their list and build their talent? Or, or do you, is there a different method that you would like to see implemented sort of going forward for Tasmania if they were to enter the competition? Yeah, it's a really complicated question. I think as an opposition coach, I hope they struggle for a long time. <laughs> but that's not the right approach for the game, is it? And I th I, so, again, I'm not far from an expert on this. I'd hate to set myself up as one. But I, my, my guess is that the AFL have learnt some really valuable lessons from expansion with GWS and the Gold Coast, and they will um, improve... Um, every time they do it. And again, I, th I think there is a choice to be made with these things. Um, and th th there certainly has been a trend at the AFL um, to resist um, giving clubs the opportunity to be poor for a decade and stockpile young talent and on the assumption that after that there'll be a powerhouse for the next decade. Um, there's a real... That, that, that has been... And I think amongst some it's still the... Um, the predominant thinking that you know, you've got to rebuild for the future and once you get this young talent through and they all come through together, you'll be a dominant team. I think that that idea has really been challenged over the last decade. Um, but, you, you know, you just they're trying to find the balance. I, I don't think um, any team, even if you put superstars together, are going to come in and dominate the competition because it takes time to build cohesion. It's a really underrated um, factor in the AFL game. Um, but again, I think they've learnt lessons, the way you set up the club um, off-field, the way... And, and again, I, I am such a big advocate that if you build a successful environment and you actually have some success and, and, and you win at least every now and again, it becomes a good place to be. You know, this idea that people won't want to be in Tassie or they won't be able to keep them, well, it depends on how well they go.